what are we going to do today and tomorrow is to quickly summarize the most relevant issues from an economic and from a regulation point of view that affect mobile communications and to talk a little bit more in depth about network effects. Now, uh, we will do this in relation with mobile communications, but the idea is that the whole issue of network effects is uh, relevant for any kind of telecom service or product we may think of, okay? So uh, take the network effect part of the lecture as a very general uh, sort of overview of one of the most important phenomena in this sector that drives not only the demand pattern but also the supply side of the market in terms of pricing strategies more than everything else and in terms of industrial dynamics. Okay, so who's in, who's out of the telecom sector. Uh, Summarize very briefly what we've seen last time. The economic issues that uh, got our attention were these ones. First, the spectrum is scarce. So uh, we've seen that you need someone to allocate this good. Okay? It is a sort of a public good that needs to be allocated. And we've seen different means by which a government can allocate the spectrum. Okay? Beauty contests on the one hand, auctions on the other hand. Remember, costs and advantages of both mechanisms. Then we've spoken about the complementarity between 2G and 3G telecom services and across geographical areas. Okay, so whenever you think of investigating the emergence of a new service or the development of a new product in the telecom environment, remember that geography matters. Okay, so the specific country which you want to investigate has a role in determining the dynamics from a technical and from an economic point of view. We've also talked about standards and we've seen what is the role of standards in affecting the diffusion of this particular kind of services, how firms and consumers react to the emergence of different standards. This is an industry where more than anywhere else we've seen the emergence of subsequent standards that were basically imposed by the public authorities, okay, with the mediation, of course, of private companies. Uh, we've spoken a lot about the drivers of diffusion, talking about the switch from analog to digital technologies, about the different forms of competition and regulation, and in particular about uh, the existence of mobile virtual network operators that are actually taking some market shares across different countries. We had a discussion about this. And then uh, we've spoken about the importance of heterogeneating demand patterns. Okay, so what firms are doing in more mature markets, and this is something we've discussed also after the lecture with Marco and other people, is trying to exploit demand heterogeneity. Okay, if the market is mature, is saturated, basically it's very difficult to add up consumers. Okay, what I can do is to exploit existing consumers in order to gain some profits. Okay, and this is the direction of firm strategies right now. And then we've made some reflections on the issue of fixed and mobile substitution, complementarity, integration. Okay, where are we going now? It depends very much on the context you're considering. It depends very much on the time horizon you're considering. Whether we are talking about the beginning of the emergence of this kind of services or we are talking about market saturation. Okay, and fixed mobile telephony complementarity or substitution is very difficult to evaluate because what we need in order to understand and to measure this would be price cross elasticities. Okay, and this is something which is very difficult to collect in terms of information. Okay? Uh, we are not going in depth into the regulatory issues, but I think that it's worth at least highlighting some important problems that uh, have been characterizing the mobile telecom environment so far, and some of them are actually also present nowadays. The most serious of one of those is this one. Okay, so there is great evidence across many different countries of collusion across different operators in terms of price fixing, okay, price strategies. So uh, last time we were talking about how different operators can gain market share in a contest where the market is saturated, okay? They need to extract surplus from consumers. 
uh, they might want to engage in a price competition, but of course, if you engage in a price competition, the outcome of that could be negative in terms of profits, okay? Uh, one of the possible ways of avoiding price of competition while at the same time, okay, trying to make uh, consumers stick to your network is colluding with operators, okay? So uh, the idea is that if you look at the different tariff plans across different operators within Europe, okay, you see many similarities, okay? Uh, from an antitrust uh, policy, this is of course an issue, it's a problem. The issue is that it is very difficult to prove that companies are colluding, okay? So the sheer observation of similar tariff plans is not enough to prove collusion. He was shaking his head. Okay. <laughs> no, no, I mean, we don't have to be convinced, I think, that they are trying to collude, but uh, if you read the details of the antitrust law, in relation especially to collusion, which is always the most shaky part of the law, okay, uh, just having information on very similar prices does not tell you anything about the cost structure of the companies. So the idea is with, let's take the text messages example, okay, how much does it cost to a company to send around or receive according to uh, the direction a text message? Probably it's the same for all companies, okay, so if we believe theory, this means that companies should price that specific service in the same way. This is not collusion, this is just profit maximizing rational behavior, okay? It is more difficult to prove this kind of uh, behavior if we think of the tariff plans. So for example, of the price for voice and data services, okay? And especially if we think about the tariffs that are charged on fixed mobile communication. Okay, so if I am Vodafone, for example, and I have an integrated network which serves both fixed communication and mobile communication, well, that's a very different situation from a mobile virtual network operator, okay, who has first to run the network, second does not have the possibility of sending or exploiting economies of scale in the different type of segments of the sector, okay, and is forced either through a price competition or to charge very high prices, okay, and try to uh, sort of compete with existing operators. So yes, I think that there is collusion. Actually, there was a, a very big case uh, four years ago, three years ago, uh, that uh, was related to the team Vodafone in Italy uh, collusion, but it is very, very difficult to prove that, okay? Um, yes? Yeah, uh, although in that case you have a third operator, yeah, okay, engaging in the market. No, 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 I'm talking about, you said the iPhone yeah, tariff. Okay, okay yes, uh, but still you know that the way in which iPhone tariffs are set depends very much on the contract that Apple is making with the different operators in the market, okay? okay? And for Apple, uh, it is quite sensible to say, okay, we're in Italy, you get these tariffs and that's it. Now from the side of consumers, of course, that's very different, okay? In the US, for example, it works in a completely different way. Yeah. So they're trying to bundle services in a way, okay? In most European countries, what Apple says is, okay, that's the tariff, that's for you operators who want to be connected to iPhone, and that's it, okay? Not very good from the consumer side, I agree with that, but of course, firms want to make profits, so we need to remember this. Uh, existing barriers on competition. Now, the market has been liberalized very much. We've seen that mobile virtual network operators have entered the market and have gained some market shares. I was reading an article the other day that in France, the old bunch of mobile virtual network operators reached 6% of their overall market share in the market, which is not a very big number, but still if you think that the entry has been quite late, is not too bad, okay? Then the problem is that that market share is divided across different firms, 
okay? And some of them, of course, are more powerful than others. But still, I mean, there is some competition coming up. The entry of traditional mobile operators allowed prices to go down, okay? So some consumers benefit actually uh, occurred in the market, but still barriers to competition are quite high. Uh, one additional issue that was raised last time was the issue of mobile uh, number portability. And Marco was saying, well, I've changed my operator. Is that correct? And that was quite quick. I mean, I didn't have any problem uh, with that. And it was a very smooth process, OK? Uh, now, number portability was probably the highest barrier to competition, okay? And so the European Union uh, decided to impose to existing operators to allow users to change numbers without any additional charge or without waiting for too long, okay? Now, uh, with number portability, what you observe is that you have a very less aggressive exposed competition. So once the users are there in the market, if you have number portability, okay, you cannot do very much. But you try to have the users with you all the time. So competition ex ante, if you want, is very tough. Okay. Now, since I like numbers and actual data, okay, this is uh, the uh, Emergence of number portability in different countries, Singapore, Hong Kong, UK, Netherlands, 1997, 1999, hello, Italy, 2002. Okay, so that's when actually number portability was brought into the country. Okay, and then other countries uh, followed. So the very last ones, 2005, not clear. <laughs> Okay, Czech Republic, Slovakia, New Zealand, Japan, Mexico. Some of you want to investigate this further. I strongly uh, encourage you to do so. A uh, more interesting picture, okay, the delays in implementing mobile number portability, okay, uh, and the reasons for that. So there was a study mostly based uh, upon uh, consulting company information, okay, and if you look at this, Austria had originally planned to import mobile number portability in 2003. It started actually in October 2004 with 15 months of time lag. Why was that? Because large mobile operator, of course, opposed okay? number portability. Uh, Germany was even worse. Okay? So the original plan was in 1997. They started officially in November 2002, okay? Uh, different reasons for that, international standards, consideration, public consultation, time needed to design solutions. In the end, it all comes down to the strategy of mobile operator, okay? And in Italy, we had a very similar delay, okay? So now we are all happy that we can easily change operator, okay? But the process was not smooth at all. Okay. Uh, was number portability actually effective? What do you think? Well, now you can change operator, okay, quite easily. How many of you changed operator in the last three years? Wow, but you're a <laughs> selected sample, so, okay. Uh, why did you do so? Why did you change? Okay, uh, it's not very easy to compute prices uh, of different operators, though. So, were you looking at specific issues or just you felt that the price? I can have uh, everything uh, I was paying was double. Uh, okay. Uh, okay, so there is price competition, yes? Okay, so so called bandwagon. Okay, I basically. Uh, take the operator of my friends, family, whatever it is. Others, yeah? Uh, in general, we have uh, very compressed, compressed our system. So actually, we can compare the most familiar price and the uh, next best price. Yeah. So in general, we live quite uh, uh, transparent with the prices. Uh, <laughs> talk less quickly, <laughs> I guess. <laughs> and uh, in Denmark, it's a very complicated business that we just pay everything. Okay. Of course, they can decrease the prices because they have no additional 
physical infrastructure in a way. Uh, we can do that as well in Italy, although the transparency is a, is a more serious issue. But at least, I mean, you can easily change operator also via the web. Marco, in terms of prices? Oh, yeah. Ah, okay. So you engage in tough calculation, okay. Uh, but you had broken your cell phone, so you had a reason for changing around. Mm -hmm. No, 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 but. Okay, an advertising campaign as well. Okay, other reasons or they, yeah? After four years, my operator did not offer me anything. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, so I emailed them and said, please don't offer me anything. Mm -hmm. And they said, So, uh, very, very attractive offers at the beginning, which is one of the most common strategies, three, and then I don't know. Mm -hmm. uh, about, okay, <laughs> about your choice, but uh, the idea is that at some point when the market is not probably saturated, a new operator comes in and the real threat that he or she can pose to the existing companies is price, okay? So basically that's a way to attract customers by advertising campaigns, by other sort of mechanisms, okay? And some people actually move. How many? This is the percentage. We have also information for the fixed line, although remember that the fixed environment is uh, very different from the mobile one. Uh, this is the percentage of mobile subscribers that actually ported their number, okay? Uh, we see some interesting cases. Ireland is 7.2%, Spain 8.7%, Italy 4.7%. What is it, Finland 7.5, but these numbers are not extremely, okay, big. So yes, number portability has some effect, of course, on the behavior of different users, okay, uh, but the big effect, the big picture is not uh, one of extreme competition across the countries, okay. Uh, the other interesting information that would be really relevant to collect is which operators do users switch to, okay? Did any of you switch to a mobile virtual network operator? No. Okay, they are very competitive actually in terms of prices. So if price is what you're interested in, uh, you should go for them, okay? But none of you did so, which means that in terms of overall market shares and competition, we still have a very structured oligopoly out there. Okay, I don't know about cases such as Denmark, for example, which is not there because it didn't have the information, but, uh, but I still think that in terms of market shares, number portability was not as disruptive as some might thought. Okay, so uh, this was one of the most important barriers. It still is to some extent. Consumer inertia, of course, is a very big issue. In some countries, also in Italy, up to some point, for example, Tre did it, uh, there was a process of SIM card locking, okay? So that if you bought a phone from, I don't know, Nokia, for example, okay? You had a SIM card of a specific operator with that. Now, of course, you could change that, but uh, again, users tend to be very lazy and the idea is that, okay, I buy a cell phone, I got a SIM card, that's fine. I got my number and then I think about that, okay? Uh, this is really up to carriers, so not all the mobile operators decided to implement these strategies, but in some countries, for example, in the UK, it was a very powerful means of acquiring new customers, okay? So giving away the mobile phone for free, basically, but locking customers with the embeddedness of a SIM card. Uh, other barriers to competition, okay? Up to some point, there has been uh, surely differential coverage and roaming, 
Okay, and again, we were discussing very much at the end of the lecture wind strategy in Italy. Okay, now wind is the third operator that entered the Italian market and for quite a long time it was known not to be as good as other operators in terms of coverage. Okay, so in some areas, for example, uh, you weren't really covered by that operator's network. Okay, roaming is also a very important issue. Of course, this is more important in terms of international calls right now than in terms of domestic calls. You do not have many problems in roaming on different operators' network. Okay, at the international level, this is important. Okay, and it's important especially in terms of prices. Okay, so whether you go in some countries or in others, you have one specific operator or you have another operator, it makes a big difference in terms of international tariffs offerings. Okay, all these barriers actually lowered competition even in a context where allegedly companies could just enter the market and compete. Okay, still remember that there are costs in building the network. Of course, the spectrum is allocated on a public base, which means that not everyone can just enter and provide mobile communication services. If you're a mobile virtual network operator, yes, you can get into the market, but you have to pay a rent, a fee, to the existing companies, okay? And that, of course, is still a barrier to lots of companies. And then we come to Rita's comment, okay? Network-based price discrimination. Uh, Network-based price discrimination uh, is uh, the strategy that is implemented by companies uh, which allows users to call at a lower fee users that use the same network as they do. Okay, so if I'm a Vodafone user, I can call Vodafone users at a lower tariff than TRE users, for example. Okay, uh, this has been a very popular strategy throughout all the history of mobile communications, okay? For very different reasons, if you remember the v last time we were discussing about demand heterogeneity, okay? So the first users that got into the market were usually business users, okay? With a very high willingness to pay and so on and so forth. Uh, the second group of users that entered the market were users with a low, lower at least, willingness to pay, consumers like we are, okay? Companies were trying to lock in existing users by adopting this kind of strategies, okay? And these kind of strategies are particularly effective when you have a big network of users, okay? So in context of saturated markets, okay? When the number of calls that is made is very high, okay? And when actually you cannot really have new users coming into the market but all you are left with is extracting surplus from your existing users or stealing users from your competitors, okay? Now, uh, network-based price discrimination is one of the most serious barriers to competition, okay? And it's also one of the strategies that drives somehow demand patterns in the market, okay? Uh, we will come back to this issue related to mobile communications in a while, but before doing that, uh, we start talking about the so-called bandwagon effect, okay? Uh, which is a little bit related, yes? Just the last one question. I'm not quite sure. What do you mean exactly? And is it, for example, if all my friends are Vodafone and I chose Vodafone, I have a special class rate within Vodafone, or is it like those special offers that they send you that say, uh, call your free preferred number with me and Both of them would be classified as uh, network-based price discrimination, okay? In one case, it's just all my friends. In the other, who have the same operator as I do. In the other case is I have very, very preferential tariffs to the first three or four or to the person I'm talking more, okay? Both of them exploit the idea that I have benefits if all my friends, for example, are within the same network. Okay, of course, this is true for mobile communication. It might be seen as true also for fixed communication or for other kind of networks, and uh, we will see them uh, in more detail. Uh, now, bandwagon effect. You've probably heard this 
word before. You know what is a bandwagon in the first place? Yes. Uh, it is a train. What do you mean? Yeah, originally, uh, it was a wagon that uh, was meant to bring around bands, circuses, and everything all over the place. Okay, so this is the band wagon. Then the term has started meaning, okay, one of the wagons of the train that is transported by all the others. Okay, but originally it was this big, if you want, cart whereby different people were jumping in, okay, at different stages in different places, and of course you were forming these big parades, if you want. So this is the original meaning of the bandwagon. Uh, bandwagon effects in telecommunications are a very interesting phenomenon. Okay, the idea is that consumers of a specific product or of a specific service, okay, benefit from being able to communicate with more and more people as the market expands. Okay, uh, now just to make sure that we understand this correctly, a telephone has no value if I'm the only user. Okay. While there are products who have value even if I'm the only user. Okay? So telephone networks, both fixed and mobile networks, are particular cases that exhibit network or bandwagon effects just because I have no value at all okay, from buying a mobile phone, for example, if I'm the only one. That's pretty obvious, but we need to get it correct. Okay? Because we might have bandwagon effects Okay, uh, even if we think of the case by which I buy a product and a service, okay, and as the set of users expands, I have more companies providing me complementary products in a competitive way. Okay, now, two important things here. Uh, existing companies that provide complementary products in a competitive way provide benefits to me. Okay, if the market for complementary product is not really competitive, then the bandwagon effect is not very beneficial to the user. Okay, but in case of complementary products, at least I can have a value deriving from buying a single product or a single service. Okay, and then I can exploit the fact that as the set of users expands, more companies are sort of uh, driven in the market because they want to make profits on existing users, okay? So these are two situations that have in common the idea that as the set of users of the products or services expands, okay, my benefits increase. But the mechanism is very different, okay? And remember this, I have no value of buying a phone if no one else is doing that, okay? I might buy a mobile phone and hoping that someone will develop data communication standards, okay? But if they don't do that, I'm fine with my, my mobile phone, okay? Uh, now, the fact that as the set of users expands, my benefit increase is basically identified in the existence of demand side scale economy. Okay, what are scale economies? Well, we've spoken about them when we were discussing the emergence of a fixed telecom network. Scale economies means that as the set of users expands, my average costs go down. Okay, these are traditional scale economies. Okay, demand side scale economies, so they have to do with the benefits of the users, means that as the set of users expands, my average benefits, if you want, increase. Okay, so I have more benefits from buying a product or service, and therefore I'm more willing to pay for that. Okay, this is the mechanism. So if we look at scale economies from the supply side of the market, the idea is my average cost decrease as the set of user expands, and so I can charge, I can, a lower price. Okay, from the demand side, the idea is as the set of users expands, my benefits increase and therefore I'm willing to pay more. 
okay? I can afford or my willingness to pay increases as I have more users using exactly the same product that has network effects, okay? So basically demand side scale economies are conditions that generate increasing benefits to each single users as the set of consumers as the market, if you want, expands, okay? So the idea is that uh, if someone else subscribes to a specific service that I'm using, the social networking, for example, okay, then I can get benefit from that, okay, and other users in the network can do the same, okay? So this is the way in which we might define bandwagon effects, and these effects are extremely common in the overall telecom environment, okay? We'll talk a lot about social networking as well in the second part of the course. Okay, that's a clear case whereby I have actually benefits because lots of people are using the service. Now, the case of social networking, however, okay, does not mean that I do not have any benefit in no one is using the network. I might as well use my Facebook page to put, to upload photos, to just store some videos and so on and so forth. Okay, this is not the same as the telephone. Okay, whoops. So, from the existence of bandwagon effects, we define a network effect, okay? Probably you know this definition quite well. Uh, a network effect exists if the value of joining a network by buying compatible products, by buying basically the same services, is increasing in the number of other adopters, okay? who join the network by purchasing products. And this is known as increasing returns to adoption. Now, we will not see details of the models that are behind this, but my interest in this is that you understand uh, the concept of network effects and of bandwagon in the case of telecommunication, and that we think of what are the limitations, for example, of all this theory, if you want. Okay, when we think of the specific cases of mobile telecommunication, fixed telecom, and social networking. So the idea is ge very generally that the more users adopt a service or a product, okay, the more benefits are in the network. Okay, and yes. Yes, can you give me an example of this? Uh, like we have an Indian uh, networks are very saturated, right? So as more users adopt, like it could be any technology at the shop, like but BSN doesn't come. Okay, so you're talking about technical problems. Yes, that could be the case, congestion. Okay, in any network is a big problem. And it derives straight from this. Okay, because if I think that I have benefits, more and more users are using the network, at some point, the network might collapse. Okay, Toby, you had a question? No. About highways, I mean, it's not a technical application, but a highway, if you have more and more users, it gets more and more annoying. Eventually, there's just congestion. Uh, yes. My question to you about highways is, where is the network effect? Okay, very good. Providing no complementary products like auto bridge or gas, basically. Okay, so uh, let's try to summarize. He mentioned the issue that, okay, but this is not always true because we might have congestion, okay? Uh, deriving from the existence of network effect. Then Toby said, yeah, but it's the same thing as highways, for example, okay? Because I have too many users in the highway, we cannot go uh, fast and so on and so forth. Then I was saying, yes, but why shall I go on a highway? Because other users are doing that, because this is what network effect imply, okay? And he said, well, if not many users are exploiting the highway, the government or whoever else wouldn't build the highway in the first place, okay? So I have an indirect, if you want, network effect, okay, which derives from the idea that companies do not have incentives to do okay, to build a proper infrastructure if not many users are actually using that, okay? Uh, Fabio was talking about 
complementary products or services. Yeah. Raise your voice again. Okay. Okay. So uh, the idea is, as a user, I might be willing to use a highway beside the fact that it allows me to go faster than in normal streets, because in that way, I expect companies to invest mm -hmm. in the highway because they see profits coming from a very big mass of users. Okay. Uh, telecom, let's say, congestion in a telecom network and congestion in highways are different effects because they derive okay, for the, from the existence of two different network effects. So we have network effects, but in a different way. Okay. This is the telephone way. Let's call it like this, direct network effects. Okay. So as soon as I subscribe to a telecom service, fixed, mobile, whatever it is, internet, okay, I have a direct and immediate connection with other users, okay? Which means that basically the number of systems, think of the handsets, for example, of the proper mobile phones that can be created by a user, okay, equals exactly the number of other adopters, okay? As soon as I get my mobile phone, this means that in principle, I can communicate with everyone else on earth that has a mobile phone, okay? This is in principle, and uh, again, we have to be quite clear on the specificities of the network effect approach, okay? So I could talk with everyone else. This does not mean that I want to talk with everyone else in the first place, okay? But in any case, I have the opportunity to do so. Uh, highways and the existence of complementary services, okay, has something to do with indirect network effects, which means that uh, it is not just a matter of the size of the network, okay, but indirect network effects have to do also with the development of complementary products, of additional, if you want, highways that is related to the incentives of companies, okay? So the idea is that companies m have to see profits in developing complementary products, otherwise they do not do so, which means that the network has no value, okay? But still, I can go with my car on an highway even if not many users are doing that. While with the telephone, if I'm the only one, okay, it doesn't make any sense, right? So, direct network effect, the effect is, is there, is direct, okay? Indirect network effect, we have a time lag between the actual building of the network, of the infrastructure, if you want, and the supply of complementary products, okay? More than this, uh, indirect network effects generate benefits for the users, but the supply of complementary products has to be competitive, okay? Think again of the highways example, if we want to depart a bit from the telecom one. Okay, if you think of the, I don't know, resorts around the highways, if we think of the gas stations, competition is not really there. Okay, actually gas stations are more expensive on the highways than there are, I think you know this, outside of the highways. Okay, so yes, there is a network effect because I have more gas stations around because users are actually exploiting the network and therefore I have benefits as a single user, but beware that in terms of prices, this might not always be the case, okay? So I have a greater availability of complementary products. This is not to say that these products uh, are provided in a competitive way, okay? At competitive prices, if you want, okay? Uh, we are going back to congestion in a minute. So the idea is that whenever you have bandwagon effect, Network effects exist, they can be direct telecom cases, they can be indirect, many, many cases, not only related to the ICT environment, but also to more traditional goods, okay? For both kind of networks, okay, the size of the network, so the expansion of the user set is the crucial mechanism, okay? So in different ways, but the crucial 
mechanism has to do with the size of the network, okay, with the number of users. Okay. Uh, now, behind this idea of network effect, okay, there is a very strong hypothesis, and this is extremely strong. So nowadays, everyone talks about network effect. Okay? Forgetting that uh, the setting, if you want, of this approach is very precise hypothesis. Okay? The first one of which is this one. So the idea is that as the set of users expands, the service or the product becomes more valuable to some people. It does not become less valuable to anyone. Okay? So first, network effect theory, if you want, does not take into consideration congestion problems, at least in its very basic formulation. Okay? Uh, because we can have users that, as the set of users expands, benefit from the network, and users that have a cost, okay? for example, deriving from congestion. Second, what second? What's also not wrong, but not necessarily precise in this hypothesis, if you think about the reality, if you think about your own experience, for example? Is it always true that as the set of users expands, let aside congestion, okay, the service becomes more valuable? I'm asking. Yes. Okay, uh, so you're basically saying, well, a good or a service is very valuable when it's kind of scarce, okay? At some point, okay, again, if we believe uh, economic theory, at some point, as the set of users expands, the good or the service get, becomes a commodity, basically. So, yes, I have a value because I can talk with my friends or family, but I do not have this additional value to that, okay? Other opinions, comments? Uh, remember that, yes? Yes, we are coming now to the demand structure, okay? So, of course, there's an issue also of the price of the good of the service, okay? Because what I said before is that if something is valuable to me, then I'm willing to pay more, and companies know that, okay? So, in the very end, if we look at the value that I provide to the price, okay, given the price that I pay, I might, might not be really better off. Yes? Okay, yes, this is an example. So it depends very much on the users we are talking about, okay? Uh, the case of Facebook, yes, this is a nice example, okay? So if my mother or my father joined the network and asked my friendship, okay, I might turn them down, right? Uh, think of the mobile network. Think again of mobile communications, okay? If an unknown person in Italy get connected to the mobile network. What's the benefit for me? I do not have any benefit, okay? So that person to me might cause congestion, at least more than it used to be, might give incentives to firms to increase prices because the network expands, okay? But personally, I do not get any benefit from having someone else out there with which I'm not communicating with joining the network. Okay, yes. 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 
Yes. Uh, in terms of development of complementary products, he's correct. If they say, well, I might not have benefits, direct benefits, from a direct network effect perspective, but still, if we believe that having big networks allows firms to develop more products, for example, or more services, then that user out there might be beneficial to me. Okay, yes? Okay, yes, so if we reason in terms of uh, time horizon, again, it somehow related more to indirect network effect, although it's a mixture of the two, then we might say, okay, right now I do not have any benefit, but I might gain benefits in the future. Okay, you have to be very rational from an economic point of view, though, to, to do so. Not entirely sure about this, but <laughs> we can discuss this further on. Okay, uh, this is to say that in general, each user's demand depend on the number of other users, okay, for products or services that have network effect, but it depends very much also on who those users are, okay? And this is why very often uh, what we see emerging, for example, over the internet that by definition has network effect, are community of interest, we talk about specific user sets, okay? So the idea, the whole concept of network effect has to do in particular with subsets of users, okay? That's where actually the benefit can increase very much as the number of users expands, okay? So uh, let's aside the case that he mentioned, which was very, very interesting, and he's, if you want, the, the other face of the congestion problem, okay? The idea is that generally I'm interested in a subset of users, in the behavior of a subset of users, okay, around me. So Rita decided to change her mobile operator because her friends and family members, I guess, had another operator. Okay, not because most of the market was subscribing to a specific operator. Okay, uh, just to bring you back to economics uh, for 30 seconds, okay, this means that the outcome of the process of developing a new service or a new product, okay, might be double. So the idea is that you might end up with no users at all because no one actually makes the first move, okay, or you might end up with a network that basically coincides with the old market, okay? So uh, since I'm really conditioned in terms of choices by other users in the market, okay, if no one adopts at the first stage, if you want, then given network effects, no one else has incentive to do so, okay? Uh, with indirect network effect, the so-called null set okay, is quite unlikely because in any case I can reason in terms of potential benefits. I can think of complementary products or services that might emerge out of a bigger network. Okay? But in case of direct network effects, the telephone, this is a very important issue. Okay? So uh, who decided to adopt the mobile phone first? Why did they do so? Okay, because the network was not there at the beginning. Okay, well, they could communicate with the fixed telecom users. Okay, why do you think people started using mobile networks, mobile communications? Yes. Okay, Rostobi, wow, yeah. No, no. Okay, yes. I was asking, now you're bringing out an issue, which is? So like a provision of people just to uh, introduce a new lifetime and uh, <laughs> maybe it's kind of like you said, people can have two <laughs> or three ones. 
Okay. Okay, so uh, I'm coming not that much pioneers in a, if you want, Roger's perspective, but more people who actually needed them for business, for other kinds uh, okay, of activities. Uh, Marco, Daniel. Okay. 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 <laughs> yeah, yeah, I do know. <laughs> okay. This is a very good point. Okay, so uh, maybe not mobile telephones, but telephones that somehow allowed me to move around. This was the first stage. Okay, Rita. <laughs> You've studied too much. Uh. Yes. See that when other people talk, you tend to distract yourself, even if she was actually making very interesting points. Anyway, so demand curve, okay? Quantity price at which users want to subscribe to a service. Uh, how does it work? The first type of users, business users if we want, who join the network are those who value the service the most, okay, for any given market size. So whatever is the market size, even if it is zero, the idea is that I get into this network because I give a value to the fact that, for example, I can move around, okay? Uh, then additional users might get into the network, but in absolute terms, they do not give lots of value to the network. Okay, so uh, the idea is that I have a first set of users who are pioneers but not in the sense of Rogers, for example, uh, life cycle. These are users who need some specific activities and who need some functionality in their telephone. Then additional users get into the network although they value the service less and less. Okay. Uh, and also remember, because economics helps when you deal with network effect, that uh, when I consider the price at which firms can sell the service or the product, okay, that's the willingness to pay of users. Which means that uh, if companies are pricing the product very highly, I'm not going to buy the product if my willingness to pay is low. Okay, so if I'm in the second or third or fourth set of users that join the network, my reservation price is very low, which means that I'm quite likely not to buy the product or service unless firms price it at a low level. Okay, however, going back to what Rita was saying about, well, I can create the need, the idea is that uh, if you have network effects in place, this means that somehow someone out there, companies for example, are creating the needs for other people to join the network, which means that my reservation price can increase over time. Okay, again, we are not talking about the differences between the price that I'm paying and the reservation price. I'm talking about my willingness to pay full stop. Okay, so the idea is that over time, as the market increases, I might increase my willingness to pay, other things being equal, okay? Which is very good news for companies, by the way, okay? It is very good news for companies because even if they set a relatively high price, they can expect that in the future more users will join the network at that particular price, so without the need of lowering the price because of network effects, okay? So what we've seen in the market, thinking about mobile phones, but also about the internet, 
is prices going down. Okay, so the price, the actual price of the handset has really gone down. Okay, uh, but probably companies could have kept up prices. Okay, because the need of joining a network because of network effect would have increased in any case the reservation price of the users. Okay, so the existence of network effects and the way in which the demand is structured allows companies to set high prices even at a very low stage of the market, which is not what they usually do. Yes? Yes, absolutely. I mean, I think that uh, since price competition is not almost never appealing to companies unless they are new entrants in the market, but the market for handsets as well is quite concentrated and stable. Well, it has become stable over time. Uh, we might also expect that uh, given the cost of the companies, companies decided to add some functionality and increase the price. Okay, if everyone, I mean, would, yeah. even without, without adding other function. Yeah. Al yeah, although it is very, it's always very difficult to revert the price cycle of a product, okay? So if you started from a very high level and then you cut the price, then you have to be really powerful in the market to raise the price again. Yeah, but yes, but, but still, I mean, uh, you need a very concentrated market structure, okay? The idea is that you might do it in principle, okay? So from a profit perspective, having such a structure in the demand side might allow you to get higher prices, okay? Uh, so again, as more users join, the network effects increase the value of the service to each user. Okay, so it's like if users had two different benefits, if you want. One that derives from the functionality of the service or of the product. So I can move around with my phone, okay? That's the, if you want, crucial functionality if we think of mobile communication, okay? Uh, the second is, yes, but not only I can move around with the phone, but I can call other people in the network, okay? And that's a network effect benefit. So it doesn't have much to do with the sort of initial functionality of the service, but it has to do with the fact that the user set expands, okay? So uh, the first group of users have a high value also in terms of the product that they're going to buy. Late comers, if you want, in the market, put a very high value on the network, a much less value on the fact that you can move around with the phone, okay? So we could have stayed good also with a fixed phone. But the idea is that I'm quite happy that other people are there in the market using my cell phone and then I'm doing the same. And this is how the demand looks like. Okay, price, quantity. So the demand uh, is downward sloping, okay, after some point which means that uh, as a set of users increases, price decreases, okay? But initially, what we observe is that the existence of network effect makes the demand uh, being upward sloping, okay? Uh, which from economic perspective, but also from a managerial perspective, is a very interesting feature of the curve, okay? This up to here means that if you're a company in the market, okay, you fix a price and then you just wait for users to benefit from network effect, okay? So uh, again, what matters is not really the shape of the demand and how we arrive to this shape, but the idea that uh, there is an important consequence of an upward sloping demand curve, which is companies can charge very high price for the same thing over time just because other users are joining in the network, okay? So uh, think of a company that is charging, I don't know, 500 euros for a cell phone, okay? If you put together demand and supply, what you have is 
a specific equilibrium point. In this case, you would have two, but you just might need this one, which is the critical mass of users, okay? Uh, in order for this level to be reached, you do not need to change the price over time, which you would need if the demand was downward sloping, okay? Because in traditional demand curves, if I want to reach more users, I have to lower price, full stop, okay? Here, you fix the price, and then you wait for the bandwagon effect to occur, okay? Of course, companies do not wait for the bandwagon effect to occur, but they try to enforce somehow network effects, okay? So what we were talking about before when we were mentioning network-based price discrimination, well, that's a way to enforce a network effect, okay? That's a way of expanding my user's set without moving around prices, okay? The prices are there, but I'm just telling you that it's more convenient for you uh, to call Vodafone people if you also are subscribing to the Vodafone network, okay? That's an artificial way of creating network effect, okay? Which means that I can expand the critical mass of users given a specific price, okay? So, uh, for any price that we may think of, okay, the upward sloping part of the demand uh, represents the critical mass of users at that price, okay? Now, of course, at some point, the demand follows the more traditional pattern, okay? So some users value very, very little the network, which means that in order to convince them to adopt, you might want to lower your price, okay? So at some point, which means after this point, okay, if you want to have also these users in the network, you have no other opportunities but lowering the price, okay? But until there, you can let the bandwagon effect work for you and just see that people are adopting because it's more convenient for them to join networks that are represented by big sets of users. Uh, very important for this. Now imagine that you're a company, okay? You're launching a service in the market, okay? And you want to understand which is, if you want the level of your critical mass, which means where can you reach the break-even point if you want, okay? How would you go thinking of a critical mass? How would you go computing the number of users that actually compose the so-called critical mass? What would you do? You're launching a service. You're a mobile virtual network operator, okay? You're launching a service. You have a critical mass as well. You have a certain number of users that allows you to say, okay, my service is successful, my service fails, and it's, there's no point of providing the service anymore. How would you reason about this? How would you estimate? Imagine, again, that you're in a company, you're hired by Vodafone, they're launching whatever tariff plan or a service, okay, maybe an additional service, and they're telling you, okay, just give me a number after which I can say my service is successful. What would you do? Okay, at least some idea is coming up, okay, so he would get the average revenue for each customer, okay, which is usually available, and then? Okay, for, well, you have the cost for each customer, of course, okay, and then try to understand at which point uh, benefits and costs are the same. This would be true for any product, okay? You have here to consider that you have network effects. So, yes.
Okay. Okay. Uh, if you had to launch a new mobile service, okay, what would you be your choice in terms of target market, for example? What strategy would you implement? Old people. Okay, that's uh, an innovative strategy. Why is that? Okay, uh, so you wouldn't go for the entire population, for example? No, you think that's not worth doing that? Okay, you would focus on a specific segment, okay, which has some, not natural preferences, but some characteristics, okay, that might be uh, worth investigating and exploiting from a mobile operator point of view. Okay, uh, the network has to be very connected, okay, so I have to be sure that the critical mass I'm talking about is made of similar users in a way, users that communicate with each other. And then I go about thinking of cost revenue. In general, however, okay, there is not the critical mass. Okay? There is not a specific number that tells you that's the critical mass. Okay? But according to specific services or different population, I can identify a critical mass for my service. Okay? Uh, another important point, which is often misled by uh, scholars discussing network effect, okay? You need a critical mass to have some guarantees in terms of success of your service or product, okay? But the failure to achieve a critical mass does not necessarily mean that your product is a complete failure, okay, in the market. Why is that? Why do you think is that, even in presence of network effect? So I was saying, from an economic perspective, the network effect implies that either you have no users in the market or you have a big chunk of users in the market because the critical mass is reached, okay? But if you think in reality, okay, very often we do observe a failure to achieve a critical mass, but not really a failure of the product, okay? What happens to these products? How can mobile virtual operators survive? Okay, we discussed about that last time. They do not have a critical mass, that's pretty clear, at least if we think of mobile communication users, okay? How can they survive? How can this company survive? Yes. Okay. 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 So you're saying basically we're talking about very very small scale networks. So I cannot think about achieving, you know, very low average cost for each person because that's not what's happening in very small networks. But first, I can provide very focused and specialized services to my particular customers. I can exploit network-based price discrimination just for that group of people, okay? And that's a way of achieving some benefits even if I do not have the critical mass that is usually required in order for service to be successful, yes? Okay, yeah. Okay, uh, so you're saying, well, we're talking about new entrants in the market that do not have a very big installed base of customers, okay? Which means that I do not really need, do not have big investments in networks. I do not really need to recover what? because they're in the network, yeah. And they actually very often have also a very big installed base of users that do not use mobile communication networks but use other services, okay? So we have to remember that whenever we think of a mobile virtual network operator just to 
summarize what we've seen other times, okay? These companies are diversifying the service 90% of the time, okay? And this means that they can exploit the user base that they have, I don't know, in retail, for example, and try to create network effects for that specific user base, okay? With an advantage, if we want to call it like this, that they do not have to build a network, okay? But they have to be sure that the rents they are paying are fair, in a way. Uh, now, all that we've said so far has been uh, simplified, okay, in the so-called Metcalfe's law. Does any of you know what it is? Uh, yes. No, I don't think so. It's not Stan Metcalfs. He's an economist, doesn't have anything to do with network effects, actually. Yes, I, 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 okay. The power of processors, okay. She was mentioning the Moore law, okay. Uh, yes. Okay, then the benefits, the value of the network, okay, increases exponentially, which means to the square, not two times, but to the square of the users as the users increase, okay? Metcalf is actually the father of Ethernet, okay? So he was an engineer. Oops. Uh, the value of a network goes up as the square of the number of the users. Okay, so basically uh, this law says that each user gives exactly the same value to the network, okay, and this is, if you want, the power distribution. Okay, so the value increases up to the square of the number of users. Very simply, this is the idea. Okay, so if two users are using a telephone, we have two connections, okay. If three users, are using the telephone, we have six possible connections, thinking of both ways, okay? But, what's the problem with Metcalzo? And now we come uh, to uh, the issue that he was mentioning before. Well, uh, is it true that the value of the network goes up at the square of the number of users? Not really, okay? Why is that? We've just finished saying that the first adopters usually value more the network as compared to the late adopters. Okay, so that N is not composed of a homogeneous set of users. Okay. Second, so this is seen uh, from the point of view of the people who adopt, who decide to adopt. Okay, but since we are talking about the value of the network, we can see it also from the point of view that people who are already in the network, okay? Uh, and it's pretty clear that not all the users that connect to a network have the same value for an existing user, okay? Let's assume that there is a value, we might think of indirect network effect being into place, okay? Uh, but surely not all the users are the same. Even more, okay, we can have congestion which means that the value of the network can increase less than proportionally to the number of users, okay? Uh, maybe you would say that it might actually decrease, okay? I wouldn't put it that far, but at least surely we can think that uh, the value is not increasing exponentially, okay? So the idea is that I can have congestion from a technical point of view, but not only that, I can have information overload, okay? Now think of the internet, okay? Think of the broadband infrastructure that allows congestion to be very, very low, okay? We still have a problem of information overload, okay, on the content side. So as more users are in the network, I have more and more information, which is not always good, okay? 
And it's more or less the same example that he was mentioning about Facebook, okay? Tons of information, tons of different groups, tons of different users, sometimes users that I do not want to be connected with come into the network, okay? So the information overload has very different meanings according to what we uh, consider as a network, okay? But still, these two problems are very important. This might be solved in some ways, okay, uh, because it's technical problems, okay? You can solve congestion by pricing the network. This is the most easy way, okay? Uh, information overload, more problematic in a way, okay? So it doesn't have to do very much with the technical characteristics of the network. It has to do really with the use of the network by different users, okay? So uh, this is how network effects were determined if you want from a mathematical point of view, okay, a very simplified way that does not take into account these three issues that are very important. So users who are in the network, users who decide to go in the network, and the general effect of having lots of users around, okay? Not always very good. Now, we finished just uh, mentioning indirect network effects, and tomorrow we will talk more about price strategies and the case of mobile communication, okay. Now, with an indirect network effect, if you want, we can think of the potential benefits that users might have in joining the network, okay. Uh, potential because usually the benefits stemming from the existence of complementary products or services occur with some lag. So I'm buying a product or a service right now and I do not know okay, not always at least, what are the complementary products that will be available in two years' time, okay? So the idea is that I want to be connected in case someone out there provides complementary products or services, okay? Now, indirect network effects are present pretty much everywhere, okay? So uh, the idea is that the base product is very often a durable good, okay? A printer, DVD player, a highway, okay? A handset, a mobile handset, for example, okay? Uh, and users anticipate benefits by deciding to buy a specific product or a service, okay? Uh, if you think about the case of movies, for example, in different DVD formats, and uh, think about the fairly recent battle between uh, HD, DVD, and Blu-ray, okay? That's a perfect case uh, study for ne indirect network effect. That's what we are talking about, okay? Everyone more or less has a DVD player, whether embedded in the PC or just standalone DVD player, okay? What kind of format am I going to buy, okay? It depends very much on my expectations on the diffusion of specific formats in the market, okay? What happened in that case? Who won the battle? Blu-ray. Blu Good. How did they do that? They First time that Sony wins a battle. Okay, so uh, they targeted, uh, again, think of the network effect, a very specific group of users, okay? A very big group of users, a very profitable group of users. They were the movie production company, okay, and distribution, especially. Okay, yes? It has already an indirect network in place. When, yes, uh, when they decided to embed the Blu-ray in the PlayStation, they were actually uh, expecting to lose the battle over the DVD format, okay? And that's one of the ways in which they managed to survive, okay? The other group of companies was a consortium and it was 
led by Toshiba, who's actually also very well connected with uh, uh, movie production companies. Okay, Sony had good connections with Columbia, could exploit its network built elsewhere in co video game console. Okay, and that's how basically it won the battle. Uh, the issue with indirect network effects is that future benefits are uncertain. Okay, so uh, if we compare the case of direct network effect with the case of indirect network effect, okay, the situation on the side of companies is this one. With direct network effect, I have to convince users that there is a value in the product that I'm selling, okay, in the service that I'm selling. But once I manage to convince the users, then the market goes on. Okay, here, the issue is not very much to convince the user that a DVD player has some value, okay, because users can see that. The issue is what am I going to do in terms of complementary products, okay? So the battle moves from the, if you want, base product, okay, a telephone, in the case of direct network effect, to the complementary products. So the really important market to look at when we think of cases of indirect network effect is the market for complementary product, which very often is far from being competitive in terms of prices, okay? Also, if you think about the DVD case, right? So uh, future benefits here are uncertain, which means that users might be hindered in their decision to adopt, okay? And they form expectation on which users will go for which complementary products, okay? And that basically decides the success or the failure of a specific product or services, okay? So uh, we stop here and tomorrow we go about talking of price strategies and uh, mobile communication.